that in mind, um, let me introduce Herbert. Um, so Herbert Puchter is a full-time writer of course books and other ELT materials, and he's also a professional teacher trainer. He's been a plenary speaker at various international conferences and has given seminars in many countries in South America and across Europe. He's a master practitioner of neuro-linguistic programming, and for almost two decades, he has researched the practical application of cognitive psychology in EFL teaching. He's furthermore a past president of IATEFL, the International Association of Teachers of English as a Foreign Language. And with that, I'd like to hand over to Herbert. Herbert, over to you. Thank you very much, Eric, for, for chairing this session and for the introduction. It's good to work with you again. The appreciation is, is mutual, as you know, as another past president of, of IATEFL. And I've always um, uh, enjoyed working with you also when we were both still working for IATEFL. Um, I'd also like to thank Eve um, for all the technical support she's been giving me in setting up this, this session. I'm speaking from my office um, here in, in Austria. It's two o'clock in the afternoon here. And I'd like to uh, wish all those of you who are um, based in Europe a good afternoon, a good evening to our colleagues in the Far East, and a good morning, I guess, to those um, of you far west of here. It's great to meet all of you in cyberspace, and I'm, I'm very much looking forward to sharing some ideas with you on how we can reduce the or overcome the physical distance um, uh, between us and our young learners when we teach them online. Um, here's a short overview um, of the uh, points I'm hoping to cover in this session. And as you can see, there is a Q&A at the end of the session. So I will actually be talking for, the, uh, for half an hour now. I hope that's okay for you and we will be taking your, your questions um, then. I'd like to start with a short uh, personal anecdote. About two and a half years ago, uh, my grandson started going to school in a little Austrian village in the middle of nowhere, close to where I live. This would be a picture photo of the, the village the the school the primary school is about i don't know if you can see my cursor is about um here um so i decided uh, to come up with an idea that i offered to the school i would teach my grandson's class english for free if the school would allow me to work with these children uh, for three hours a week instead of what is usually one uh, sadly, one hour a week is what Austrian uh, state primary schools norm normally offer uh, to the children. So we'll probably all agree that three hours a week is not a lot, but it's a lot better than one hour. Anyway, my proposal was accepted and I've been teaching this class for almost three years now, enjoying every minute of what's been a very exciting um, learning uh, and teaching experience uh, for me. Well, looking back 10 weeks, I remember that communicating in English with those kids was not only fun for both, of, for both them and me, but most satisfying too. They seemed to I mean, these are not photos uh, from my class. They're just agency photos for obvious reasons. I can't take the real photos because I would need to go to all the parents and ask for, for permission that would take too long. So they're just agency um, photos here. They seem to love the lessons and their level in all skills was remarkably high given I only taught them for three hours a week. And what's more, I kept getting quite a lot of unsolicited, but very positive feedback from the parents. And then out of the blue, everything changed because of a virus. And as you know, this is not the beginning of a dystopian novel, but the reality that we've all gone through in some ways or another. 
while my recent classroom experience may well be different from yours, what we do have in common is that the coronavirus induced changes and the need to move the teaching and learning from the classroom to cyberspace was at least initially a surprising and I guess for some of us, uh, even shocking reality. There's another point I'd like you to consider. If what I've said just a second ago had indeed um, come from a dystopian novel, the school lockdown could easily have been the turning point at which the teaching of English was taken over by uh, computers. In such a dystopian scenario, algorithms would have been used to develop resources and activities and the needs of um, every learner, every single learner indeed, would have been met. The pandemic scenario uh, would somehow have been balanced um, through mountains of data being available on a global scale. And that's why the success of these so-called adaptive learning programs would have been a given. But this, of course, is where the dream or the nightmare, whatever you want, um, ends. Let's not forget, however, that several years ago, um, some people and some publishers had already claimed that adaptive learning systems were basically ready to take over or to enrich our teaching at least and raise the efficacy of students learning to new heights. Far from it. In, in this current situation, it's clear that educational managers, school owners, ministerial decision makers and parents alike have understood or rediscovered, I think, how important good teaching is and how important good teachers are. Many colleagues around the world who feel passionate um, about teaching and who wouldn't want to work as anything other than a teacher have also rediscovered something they've known for some time and frequently applied in their classrooms or have at least realized intuitively and, communicat and communicated unconsciously um, that in order to teach children successfully, whether online or in classrooms, we often find that the passion we feel for teaching kindles a passion in the learner for learning. So that what follows is full engagement, a sense of progress and the joy of being able to interact with others in and through a new language. Um, very much, you know, in line with, with um, uh, William Butler Yeats's uh, quotations that I've quotation that I've uh, put up here. And this is where the journey started for myself as a teacher of that group of nine-year-olds in their third year of learning English. I discovered uh, myself pretty early in my career that we always need to bear in mind that a classroom is not a kind of filling station uh, where the teacher fills the students' empty brains um, with knowledge, or in our case, language. It's in many ways, the classroom, uh, that is, it's in many ways uh, what Vygotsky calls a zone of proximal development, where the teacher is confident that what learners can do today, with help from the teacher, they'll be able to do independently tomorrow. In this particular case, of course, proximal means close to success. So, so the learner facilitates, scaffolds the students um, um, uh, getting on to the next sort of stage in their, in their development. So um, we're talking about this kind of nudging or scaffolding. Adding to that, the, the venerable uh, linguist Gordon Wells makes the point that um, whenever people uh, collaborate um, in an activity, each can assist the other and each can learn 
from the contributions of the others. So I promised 10 uh, tips. Um, and here's my, my first one, my first OTT, online teaching tip. I hope you, you don't think it's, it's completely OTT. Uh, my OTT number one, which is actually, we need to make sure that um, we offer plenty of opportunities for students to collaborate. In other words, what we, what we see here, um, the teacher teaching online, so T in the green circle is teacher, and obviously we have a number of students, S1, S2, etc., sitting in, the, on, in front of their laptops or, or uh, um, uh, tablets or, or computers or even, even mobile phones sometimes. Um, but this is an important social arrangement. But this is by no means the only possible arrangement or even the only possible and advisable one. It is essential though, of course, for all kinds of teacher-led instructional um, phases. So as you can see here, um, there are just a few examples, there are others of course, for all kinds of short housekeeping announcements, for explaining tasks and clearing fine uh, language for storytelling, etc. But if we believe, as Gordon Wells does, um, in the socio-cultural dimension of learning, that is how great a positive effect can be gained from the interaction between teacher and learners, and between the learners themselves, we need other social arrangements as well. We need pair work, for example, and group work. In a classroom, this can be very easily arranged, as you know. We ask each learner, I'm sorry, some of the um, students have run away, it seems here. Student one can still be seen, but we can't see um, uh, just the, the labeling of the other dots, but you know these are the students. So we just ask them to turn to, to one another, and um, our classroom is perfectly arranged for doing um, pair work. The pair work and group work surely can't uh, be achieved in, in cyberspace. Well, can they? Well, I think they can, and I have actually used them, and this is what I'm going to be talking about now. I've actually been successfully using them uh, for quite some time. What I'm now going to share is what I'm doing in my situation. I'd like to stress this. Of course, there may be situations, for example, um, if, if your internet connection is very poor, uh, that some of the things I'm suggesting you can't do, or if your students, if some of them are not online, this is of course a completely different story. Uh, so, so please um, uh, see what I'm talking here as a description of what I'm doing and not necessarily of something you could all be doing in your situations. But I'm, I'm very, very hopeful that um, quite a few of the suggestions I'm going to make can be applied to your situations too. So um, here's my, my uh, online teaching tip number two. We need a little help from our friends. And our friends in this case are the, um, uh, the learner's parents. Um, in, in the current situation, of course, the, the one thing we've been lucky about maybe um, has been the fact that, that in quite a few countries around the world, because of the lockdown situations, uh, learners, uh, sorry, parents were actually at home with the learners, so they could give them um, quite a bit of um, support. So what do we need parents support for in this, this case? Well, what I'm talking about is, I'm talking about creating what I call a learning buddy system, where students work in pairs as learning buddies. So they do not only take part in the sessions with me, where everybody is involved, they also talk to one another in pairs, they meet online, for example, using Skype or other means, and parents initially help them uh, to set this system up. Once the, the buddies have agreed to work together, I have experienced it's best to keep these partnerships unchanged. 
so that students will work with the same learning body, not just once, um, but actually for longer time, whenever you ask them to work in these pairs. Parents and children will know that, and that helps a lot. It's also easier from um, a management point of view to keep the same learning bodies. We need to give students clear instructions and make sure they understand them. Parents too need to know the tasks, or at least need to know the dates when their children need to do them by. Um, uh, then parents can organize between themselves when their kids meet up in cyberspace and do a bit of monitoring if they can uh, uh, and have, if they have the time. In my experience um, thus far, it's been amazing how well uh, parents have supported their kids some of them speak English, speak good English, others don't, but they've been extremely helpful in setting up the system. And now after several weeks of online learning, the children are all very fit really, uh, and they can connect with each other independently um, from me. Um, so whenever I ask them to do something with their learning buddies, they do that um, uh, in these pairs. I have regular online meetings with parents too, and sometimes I write them um, a group email. I also invite parents to observe their, their child's learning, and that's something uh, that I think ex is extremely important. Um, I ask them not to judge it. I ask, I tell them and I stress that learning a language is a process where making mistakes is not only unavoidable, it's actually necessary. Making mistakes is a part of learning. And it's important they accept that. It's important that they don't judge their, their children. Uh, and it's amazing, actually. I've noticed um, that when we meet up, you know, sometimes in, in cyberspace also, this is such a small village. I, I often, you know, see parents uh, when I go running or walking or what have you. So <laughs> the parents of my learners actually um, have commented quite, quite um, uh, frequently that this has been a fantastic learning experience for them. Uh, that they have had quite a few aha moments about language learning and they're comparing this to their own language learning experiences. Um, you know, um, um, a few decade, decades ago. If you want to try the body system, the learning body system out, um, make sure you occasionally join a um, um, pair of learning buddies, primarily so to tell them that what they're doing um, uh, is great. So praise them for it, but also, of course, if necessary, to readjust their learning process um, a bit. So which parts of um, the learning process can actually be done by, by learning buddies? Well, um, and so this is what I, sorry, I'm, I'm, I, I forgot to click here. This is what we need parents um, for. We need to help um, uh, them or help us set up the system, help us manage it, help us manage the time to a certain extent also. And so that's why I believe we need to keep good rapport with the, the parents and with the parents will be, will be grateful for that. And now the, the slide I promised, what can be done by learning buddies? Well, they can learn, I, I'll give you an example in a minute. They can learn uh, new words together. They can um, do most of the skills work between uh, them. Of course, um, this depends, like, uh, for example, if you want them to listen to an audio, you need to be able to share the audio in, in some way. If that is not possible, then of course, this part of, of the skills work can't be done by them. Um, they can do some of the speaking um, uh, among them, themselves and, very importantly, they can test each other. I mean, self-testing, I keep talking about that, um, um, is uh, extremely important, as we know. 
Um, it's becoming more popular now, fortunately, and it is a highly effective learning strategy. And so is buddy testing, where students uh, test each other. Um, so I'll give you a little example. Here is a lexical set, as you can see. Uh, students first listen to the words, then they check the words with a friend. This can easily be done by, by uh, students themselves. They then listen, correct these four sentences in number two, and finally, number three, a little revision of what was done before grammatically, but um, using the new words from number one above, students play a little miming game that if you imagine two students on Skype, they can do that without problems um, on their own. So uh, the children can do all this without me as long as they have the audios for number one and three. And they work with one another mainly to practice the new words and, and test each other. It may take a little time for them uh, to, to actually get used to this new kind of, of learning. Uh, but it's all based on standard classroom practice they'll already be totally familiar with. Um, the only thing that it's likely to be different is that when buddies work together, they may find uh, that the activities, because they are doing all the activities on their own independently, uh, they're actually quite more intense and they're quite more focused in a way than in the classroom where not everybody um, uh, all the time at the same time uh, is talking. So, so uh, students' talking time um, gets raised here. Um, as I've said, they can do that with listening. They can also do that with a, with a, a video as long as you have a good broadband. I'd like to, to try a little experiment and show you just um, a short extract from um, a video here. I'm aware that some of you may not be able to see this depending on your bandwidth. My apologies if you don't. I will just play, say, 15 seconds or so. So if you can't see it, please don't uh, be too frustrated. Okay, here we go. I'm stopping it here because I saw that quite a few have no sound. So I apologize. Um, maybe I have made a mistake. I could hear the sound perfectly well. So I, yes, I, I got it. You, you, you couldn't hear it. I don't know. Um, Eric, Cambridge, can I get any help? What I might have done wrongly so the sound could not be heard? No, I'm not sure. I'm afraid it might be. To okay. Do um... Yeah, the, the Zoom setup. Okay, okay. Well, but I, I, I guess you, you can imagine I use such videos with my learners, and and uh, you know they're watching uh, those things on their own, they're doing the the follow up activities on their own in their learner learning uh, among the learning buddies. Um, so uh, you know, sorry, I'm, I've gone um, um, one. Uh, too far. Here, if you have a look at this, uh, of course, any kind of role play activities are ideal for this body work. Let's have a look at this example here. Uh, students have two role cards, student A and student B. A, you are at the sandwich shop. Choose three fillings for your sandwich, order a sandwich and a drink. And B is um, an assistant at this sandwich shop and they choose a roll card, they prepare the roll card, they have some language prompts down here and then they act it out. Um, so uh, if uh, students do something 
like that. Um, I, I've ch I can see a question now. What course book do you use with your grandson's class? This is the ideal moment for me to do a little bit of, uh, to put my promotional hat on for one second. The video you have seen but not heard, and the page you're seeing here, and the, pa the, the previous pages, they are from the forthcoming second edition of Superminds. So I'm um, uh, kind of working with uh, uh, some of these materials uh, in, my, in my classroom. And um, uh, this is an example, this is another example. So if we want to do that, going back to the role play um, activities, I think what we need to do is we need to help students use digital recording devices so they can present the outcomes of their learning to the teacher and to other students. Most um, online um, platforms or, or communication platforms, softwares, um, have such digital recording devices. So teach students how to use them. Uh, they love doing this kind of thing. Some are a little bit shy initially. I always tell them that it's, it's, it's also initially it was uncomfortable for me to, to see myself on video or to hear myself, uh, you know, on an audio recording. And I tell them, always tell them the story, which is true, that our voice always sounds different when it's recorded because there's a little bone in our inner ear that is vibrating when we listen to our own voice when we speak, but that same bone doesn't vibrate when they hear their voice from the, from the recorder. And so they're very interested in this. And of course, uh, quite a few of them say, yeah, I don't like it to see myself, blah, blah, blah. But, but then we say that it's, it's actually great, you know, to have those videos because we can see how we're learning, how we are progressing, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the next teaching tip number four here is arranging students in speaking um, groups, uh, ideally of, of four students per group, again with the help of parents initially, but I'm always present in those groups. I keep a timetable, so uh, you know, when am I working with which um, uh, group. These um, groups, or the work in these groups, follows a specific routine. I start with a little bit of um, small talk, um, things like, I don't know, just a few examples here. How are you? Or another time I say, what time did you get up this morning? What did you have for breakfast? Etc. cetera, um, um, et cetera. Uh, Then I do a speaking activity or, you know, two or three of them, depending on, on um, the kind of speaking activity. And, and uh, this would just be one example, um, grammar-based. So students first do a bit of listening, um, listen and tick the food that someone is putting in the, in the soup they're making. Then they put the words in order. Um, uh, the, the grammar point obviously here is making suggestions. Shall we put some carrots in the soup or how about some, and how about some onions? Then there is the language focus here. And then um, I say to two students and the other two are watching this. Uh, okay, now you, you practice this and the others are watching it. Then the other two. And finally, in the end, they are making a soup uh, together using the, the language they have been um, learning here. Um, an important question. Ah, finally, of course. So this is the, the final activity here. Um, finally, we do a um, short phase of, of self-reflection where I ask students to talk, basically talk about what they've learned today, um, whether it was easy or tricky, what they need to practice more, etc., etc., etc. How happy they are with their online learning, with the development of their English. And this is, of course, <clears throat> I just like to stress that a point where sometimes we need to give them some prompts. So what I do is if we have a chat window like this one here, I use the chat window to, to type in some prompts or when I know exactly what kind of prompts my students will need because I want them to talk about something that I have 
planned beforehand, then I'll type it into Word and I just copy it from Word and copy it across into the, the chat box. Let me see if I can do that here. Here's my Word. Uh, no, I have, I have actually closed my word, so that doesn't work now. I'm sorry, I apologize. So, but you can imagine, you know, just type it across from Word into the chat box, or if necessary, this is from my teaching this morning. Um, sometimes when you have problems with technology, just write it up on a piece of paper, and um, this is your, your board for online teaching. Anyway, um, so. Um, uh, as always, as teachers, we need to be concerned um, with um, process and product. In other words, uh, not only with um, the learning process itself, uh, make sure it runs well, but we also need to, to make sure we, we need to get outcomes that we can measure. So uh, here is a suggestion for that encouraging students to produce short videos of presentations they um, give. Um, uh, this is where I must, I hope you don't mind, once again crave your indulgence for me to tell you uh, more about my experience as a proud grandfather. I was explaining in a, in a, in a lesson a few weeks ago, I was playing to the kids that I would like them to do a short video of themselves presenting something. I call this at home uh, uh, videos. Topics are my favorite toys, my room, I'm having breakfast, etc. I sometimes show them a little example of this. Uh, so they, they get the idea that it's kind of a show and tell on video, so to speak. And they can use their mobile phones to, to, to record those. I was explaining to the kids that I would like them um, uh, to do something when my, my grandson interrupted me. Uh, just a minute, uh, before I, I tell you what he said, um, I, I need to explain uh, that he normally calls me Herbie. And this is quite a funny story, really. When he was a toddler, he heard a friend of mine call me that as a joke. And he has refused seriously, ever since to call me granddad. So two and a half years ago, before I actually started teaching him, I told him there was no way he could call me Herbie in class. So he said, what shall I call you then? And I said, just call me what other children in Austria learning English um, um, uh, from me would call me, Mr. Puchter. So anyway, while I was explaining that I wanted them to do one of those at home videos, he suddenly raised his hand and said, Mr. Puchta, can I make an unboxing video? And I don't know how familiar you are with uh, current YouTuber style genres. Well, I didn't have the foggiest idea of what he was talking about. Do you know what, a, what an unboxing video is? Could you just type in yes or no? No, yes, yes, no, 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 yes, no, 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 no. Okay, thank you. Well, at least some of you don't know it either. So to cut a long story short, this is what Wikipedia says about it. Unboxing is the unpacking of products, especially high consumer uh, products where the process is captured on video and upload it to the internet. The item is then also explained in detail and also can sometimes be demonstrated as well. Yahoo Tech uh, places the first unboxing video to be for the Nokia E61 cell phone in 2006, according to Google Trends. Searches for the term unboxing began to surface in the final quarter of 2006. I'm glad to realize that I'm about 14 years behind. Uh, well, I guess my grandson might end up doing this professionally one day. Uh, the video he produced was awesome, which, by the way, is a word that he used at least six times on his video while unboxing his dad's um, uh, smartphone 
and his laptop. But I really was gobsmacked, not just by the quality of his presentation skills, but in particular by the breadth, depth, and, and um, the accuracy of his English. And I was, I was really completely uh, you know, shocked. And that's um, how I found out that when he watches YouTube clips, his absolute favorites are unboxing videos. It seems to me that the popularity of these videos may be something to do with recreating the delight of unwrapping a birthday present, for example. Until that point, of course, I had thought that his English was so good because what he knew he'd learned from me exclusively. It just goes to show how much learning can be achieved by listening to engaging content for whatever reason it might be engaging. We're coming to the end now. I need another two minutes uh, to share a few of my remaining um, online teaching uh, tips. This one is when working with speaking groups, interruptions have precedent. And what I mean by that, I'm using a coin, a, a phrase coined by uh, the psychologist Ruth Korn here. And what she means is when you work with a group, if somebody has something that, that distracts them or that is kind of, they are enthusiastic about, the teacher needs to give it priority because otherwise the group will be inter interrupted. And for us as language teachers, these sorts of interruptions can be fantastic. Just to give you a, a few examples, we've had a, a cat's tail wagging through the um, screens. Um, we've, so, so, so then we had an impromptu chat about, about uh, cats. We've been interrupted by a baby starting to cry. And then we learned from one of the, the girls in that group that it was her brother who had been born 10 days before that. And, and the kids almost shouted, can we see your brother? And to their delight, the pupil's mother appeared and showed us the newborn baby. What a delightful uh, experience for me too. In the speaking groups, and this is the next one, I use an online clock. You can easily get them from the web um, to keep um, the time. I challenge the kids how long they manage to talk um, uh, without using their own language, German in the case of my students. Um, number eight, I use a glass jar and some um, uh, pebbles. So it looks like this um, as a reward system. Whenever they express something particularly well, whenever they say something that makes other students laugh, then I drop um, um, a pebble into the, the gas jar and they know, because I've told them, once the, the, the gas jar is full, there'll be a surprise for the whole class. Um, uh, class sorry. Um, eye contact um, is of course always important, but what we need to know is if we want to have good eye contact online, we need to look at the camera and not at the eyes of individual students. So when you, for example, want to have eye contact, if these are four students in front of you and you want to have good eye contact with the girl uh, in the down right uh, picture, don't look at her eyes because this will actually create an impression you're looking somewhere completely different. You actually uh, need to look up there at the camera if you want to give the impression that, that you are keeping good eye contact with the learners. I also, and this is my um, uh, online teaching tip number 10 and the final one, I uh, suggest you check their eye movements. It's always good to know where they're looking. For example, if you have something like this, which let's call them one, two, three, four. So starting one is the, the, um, the girl on the upper left, two is the child next to her, three, the boy below the, the reddish haired girl, and number four, the, the other girl, which is the one that would worry you? Number, exactly. Somebody is saying three, we're losing number three. 
And very often what happens, I have noticed in 90% of the cases, child number three here, look at the eyes, is actually looking down at a mobile phone or a, a, a smartphone. And this is where, um, where I'm, um, so this is uh, the last one, the last slide, my personal, um, sorry, my personal, um, I need to move this away here, sorry. Uh, so my personal conclusions here, online, oops, online teaching works actually, it can work really well. Some of my students have made a, a giant leap forward. Um, firstly, uh, in their learner independence and secondly, in terms of their language development, especially speaking. Uh, I personally have learned a lot from this experience in terms of the exploration of digital learning technology, but also as far as uh, developing uh, an online methodology is concerned. And I'm absolutely sure if you think of some of the things I've been presenting, like the body learning system or um, uh, students actually producing those at home videos, etc., etc., my grandson producing his these unboxing videos. Uh, this is something I will definitely continue once classrooms uh, open up again. Of course, there are many things I miss about, uh, you know, the face-to-face -face, um, real contact in the classrooms. I've also checked out, last night I checked, uh, there's a website what teachers uh, miss the most. And um, I'd like to, to finish up with a funny quotation. One colleague said, putting on real professional Codes. Okay, here we go. I'd like to um, thank you very much. And we're going to have a look at some of the questions now. Over to Cambridge, please. Thank you very much, Herbert. Fantastic. Um, and thank you all of you in the audience for a whole range of questions. So I've captured a bunch of them. Um, first one, very simple, but meaningful, Herbert. How old is your grandson? My grandson is just has, uh, has just uh, he had his ninth birthday a couple of months ago. Okay, super. And then related to that, a number of questions um, such as: Would children of eight years old be able to use the buddy system you described? Um, would yes. this kind of online teaching work with preschool learners? So maybe a few thoughts of yours around eight. Okay, thank you. Well, with let me start with preschoolers. If you do mm -hmm. this with preschoolers you definitely need the parents, I would say. I've never done it with preschoolers, but I think it is possible if you do it with parents present. Um, um, and as we know, uh, parents would actually love that. So I, I, my answer would be yes. Uh, with eight-year-olds, yes, definitely. We need to train them well. I mean, I'm, some of the kids in, in the class I'm working with are eight and a half. My, uh, my, my grandson is over nine, but but it's basically the age we're talking about. It's, it's really amazing how well this has worked. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's my experience. You might come across some problems. I have some kids who are very, very difficult in the classroom uh, as far as attention goes. And it's fascinating when I work with them online. I don't know, is it the, the screen that kind of mesmerizes them? I don't know. But it's, it's actually quite amazing that they seem to focus better online. Okay, super, thank you. Then there were a number of questions around time and duration and so on. So for example, what's the best length of time for an online class? How many hours of online classes per day uh, make for good student engagement? Yes, I, I can't actually answer this question because we would need to discuss uh, uh, what, what uh, kind of um, time uh, frame your school is running on, how many hours, how many teaching hours you have. I mean, in the current situation, online teaching is all I can do with my, my students. So what I did, you know, I only have three hours a week. So I, I kind of like developed a, a schedule. Some of the things they have to do at home, there's of course, uh, there's homework, there's, there's uh, you know, workbook stuff that they usually do on their own. And then I meet up with the groups regularly and I usually do about 20, sometimes 25 minutes for the group tasks. And they take as long as they need um, uh, for their, their buddy learning tasks. Okay. So there's no one fixed answer and no. 
I would yeah. imagine as well it depends on the age of the children and probably the number of children yes. in, the, in the class. Mm -hmm. um, we had a number of questions stroke comments around tech savviness and device capability or device availability of parents. Yeah. Um, so maybe some thoughts around how to work with parents who aren't that tech savvy themselves. Uh, well, I've been lucky here, really. I mean, I, I had to give some of the parents a bit of training, a few of the parents a bit of training. Mm, quite a few of them have actually used things like, like Skype before. Uh, the ones who haven't, I, I sort of like taught them how to use it. It didn't seem a, a particular problem. And, and the kids really are tech savvy. That's, it's, it's really amazing because they have now taken over. They don't need their parents anymore to help them set up a, a session. Really. Yeah, I have the same experience. I've got a 10 year old <laughs> at home. He has a daily Zoom call with his teacher. He knows exactly what to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, how have you got any thoughts around teaching children with special needs? Um, the the writer of the question didn't uh, didn't specify what kind of special needs. But yeah, I was just going to say it depends on the kind of special needs, of course. Uh, in general, of course, I would say, but but uh, you know, it it so depends on on what kind of um, uh, needs this, this particular, uh, particular learner has, uh, you, would, you would probably need a parent for that to, to, to support you. Okay. And for reasons of time, I think this might need to be the last question, um, but it's a good one. How can we promote learner autonomy through online learning? Well, I, I hope that um, I've given you some ideas here because the the body system, the learning body system, is an autonomous learning system. I have no idea, actually, sometimes even when my learners are meeting up, and I have no idea what they're doing while they're meeting up. All I can say is that when, when I, I meet up with a class, um, uh, and I do that regularly, and I check uh, uh, on what they have done, they have actually done the tasks I've given them. So, so this, this is a perfect thing. I mean, I, for time reasons, I couldn't talk about the development of writing skills, for example. Um, uh, for time uh, reasons, I, I couldn't talk about how we can train the, the bodies to support um, each other, how we can help them to listen to an audio not just once but to sort of like decide where their problems are and start listening to specific bits of audio repeatedly so they 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 understand more easily or sometimes how they can look at an audio script also to support their listening if there are particular problems. So, I mean, online learning, I, I would think, uh, is not only a, a good way of training students to learn independently in learner autonomy. Uh, when we do online teaching, we need autonomy to a certain extent. Super, thank you very much. And also uh, just to let people know or remind people perhaps that we've got a range of articles and videos on our World of Better Learning blog, um, including uh, issues like learner autonomy, uh, teaching children with special needs and so on. So thank you very much, Herbert. Um, that was that sure. super. And we had lots of really good uh, engagement and questions there. Um, just to remind everyone that you should be able to download the certificate through the link which Eve has posted into the chat window. And also, uh, just to remind you that the next session is Draw with Harriet in just over an hour's time. And also, again, uh, later on today, you should be receiving an email with a link to the recording of this webinar on YouTube. So you can watch it again, uh, look at the slides again, and also perhaps share it with your colleagues. So thank you very much, Herbert. That was super. Um, I hope you have a good rest of the day and enjoy the continuing to teach your, your grandson and his, and his class. Thanks, Eric. And thank you all for taking part in this session. Thank you.